White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible by your support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to support and stay tuned to hear about the exclusive benefits and bonus content available with this episode. White Centipede Noise is a label and mail order specializing in noise, power electronics, and industrial music. You can find underground items by many of the artists featured on this podcast in our extensive distro. We ship internationally and update with new stock regularly. Check out what's currently available at whitecentipedenoise.com. Welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is Gray Holger. Known for his long-running label, Chondritic Sound, the project's Hive Mind and Black Sand Desert, and the noise podcast, Noise Extra. Hello, Gray, and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. Hey, Oscar. Thanks for having me. Awesome to be with you. That you joined yeah, very the happy studio. to be here. Looking great. So just looking awesome. Um, and yeah, cool that we can do this and uh, hear from you from your end. Yeah, I feel like people probably hear too much from me, but <laughs> <laughs> No, they don't. You're 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 very tastefully reserved on your podcast and I think it's great that now we can pick your brain. And I have questions from Patreon supporters and things like that, so um, oh, all right. All we're right. going to get into the whole the whole thing. Um, I would start, I guess, by asking you about your label, Chondritic Sound, which, from my knowledge, dates back to 2002. That's right, yeah. And just kind of, for me, exemplifies a big part of that mid 2000s american noise landscape so can you kind of take it back to 2002 uh what was the noise landscape noise scene so to speak in the united states at that time and internationally at the time and what prompted you to start a label at that time uh just an increasing interest in noise i had started seeing shows in detroit around the late 90s, going to noise shows and going to Record Collector, which I, I know I've mentioned on Noise Extra before a bunch of times because Davin Brainerd from Princess Dragon Mom was working there and he was stocking. He was trading with Ron. He was trading with Koji. He was just stocking all this great stuff. And then starting to see the shows and realizing I could maybe do that. I could maybe play. Some people were just playing junk, right? And yeah. Back then, it was really, it felt forum-based, a lot of it. Like, mail, sending letters was sort of still the thing, but it was phasing out. And a lot of people had email and everything by that point, of course. So, it was the the noise boards, of the, like the Tronix board, the uh, noise board 433, uh, a few other forums. There was... Stuff like the Atrax More guest book, the MSPR guest book, where you would, you know, people would be posting this stuff. And before I started the label, I was doing like a webzine that was just reviews of stuff I was buying, stuff I was listening to, stuff I was excited about. I started getting some promos, but it was really mostly just I was buying stuff that I wanted to talk about and I didn't really know where to talk about it. So. I started a crappy little website and was doing reviews of stuff. And is that still available anywhere? Uh, on the Wayback Machine somewhere, yeah. Uh, it's. I think a lot of it's kind of lost. Like I don't know if it's that updated or when you go to it, it's the, one of those like can't quite find the pages in the machine. But there were. A, I did a few interviews with people. Uh, I did. A bunch of reviews. I had a couple people writing like guest things, but it was really very crude. I didn't know what I was doing or how to do it. I'd, I'd done zines when I was in high school, but I doing a like web based thing wasn't really that great for me. And I was like just trying to get something out there. I was really inspired by like the reviews in Audio Drudge stuff like that that you'd get. And we'd 
get this catalog and it wouldn't just be or like reviews in audio dredge and, and the malignant catalog, I guess, where you'd get this thing and it would have mm. not the press blurb that we all see now, but like the person who's stalking its personal feelings about the record. And that was really important yeah. to have a different kind of connection with people in that way to read what someone's not just trying to sell you a thing. They're selling you something that they at least kind of care about and can talk about and think about. Right. Which is like a stark contrast to something like the Triple R catalogs where you're getting a list of items and a price, which also rules and it's tons of fun to look at and all the different yeah. stuff in there. But so some of that stuff might be out there somewhere. I posted on our Patreon, I, I did an interview in, was it 99 with MSBR and Government Alpha when they came to Detroit. And so like that was posted in there. Um, I had an interview I did with Taint via mail that was never really published. Um, I think it was one of the mm -hmm. kind of last things I'd put up. There were a few other things. So there's a few remnants of it that I've been able to salvage or find around or like scraps on old hard drives, but not really around too much anymore. But at that time it was, you know, like I said, the, the boards were kind of going. So immediately you tapped in and found a huge community of people you could talk to, talk about gear, ask questions that you, Maybe wouldn't ask the local noise guys, the guys at the record store. Like, I'm sure I probably did, but you just had a place <laughs> to figure out more of this stuff and then find out about shows. What shows are coming up? What Who's playing where? There's a noise bands are touring. So you start going to see these things. I started yeah. traveling for shows in the early 2000s, like driving down to Ohio and stuff to just see bands driving to grand rapids to see taint and goat and lockweld and numina stuff like that shows that were really important to me wow. at the time where you know you don't think about it then and I was driving three hours to see some bands play in like a crummy abandoned coffee shop or something felt a little strange back then i got very used to it but it was it was a new thing for me and it was really exciting and as you start making noise you want to you want to start a label right like you yeah or you want to i wanted to have product to trade with people i wasn't very certain of what I was doing or my noise. So I wanted to sure. make something and get it to people and have something to trade or offer to the people I was in contact with now, maybe to help get shows. Yeah. So I started putting stuff out and mostly my own stuff. One of the earliest releases on Chondritic, I think it's the sixth release was the uh, Cornucopia live in Detroit. Uh, Jorge Castro had come through Detroit and yeah. played a show and I recorded it on my mini disc and then asked if I could release it later. To which he said yes and of course that led to a nice friendship with jorge over the years and we, we've toured together since then but uh just a general desire to be involved in this thing that felt very much attainable very much like a community and something i wanted to be a part of there were a lot of cool people doing stuff back then yeah. like another early contact was matt taggart of pcrv and lure and uh yep. fluxus montana right and He's doing great stuff. And even back then, his noise was really killer and just a nice guy. So starting to meet people like that and get more and more in contact. And the boards would have from the person making their first tape to someone who's been doing it for years and years. So you you got a nice wide variety yeah. of it. it. It's funny to think back on that time and see how much that really impacted my life because I, I was open to this new world for a couple of years of, of noise stuff and then started being involved with it not too long after. And right. That's all I've been doing since it feels like, you know? Yeah. International misanthropy and fringe presents Friday, September 15th, 2023 at the Kingsland in Brooklyn, Bob Marinelli star Alberic DSM three half mortal dust belt, Skin Crime and Laureate. Show starts at 6 p.m. Tickets are $25 and available at the door only. Friday, September 15th, 2023 at the Kingsland in Brooklyn. Also, official Skin Crime Audio Pathology Long Sleeve now available from Hospital Productions as well as Skin Crime Recreation T-shirt. Support the artist with this official merchandise at hospitalproductions.net. The Scream and Writhe Forum is a place where people are free to share their thoughts on no... <clears throat> The Scream and Writhe Forum is a place where people are free to share their thoughts on noise and related culture, post album reviews, 
promote shows and new releases, and maintain the kind of healthy discourse that is vital to the noise scene at large, away from the strain of social media algorithms and irrelevant advertisements. And we are always looking for people like you to join in and continue the discussion. Visit ScreamAndRide.com slash forum to get in on the action. In addition to the message board, there are always over 2,000 items in stock at Scream and Ride Distro, plus several new releases on Absurd Exposition, including Barstool Mountain, Tightrope Walker LP, and tapes from Casa di Caccia, Milena and the Rita, Murmur and Muttering, and ZK. Scream and Writhe offers cheap domestic shipping rates to the USA and Canada, and affordable shipping rates worldwide. Visit ScreamandWrithe.com for the stock, and add slash forum for the talk. That's also interesting you said about, you know, the, the first tape guys to the established, you know, superstars of the scene. What I think is also interesting about those noise boards is that you saw... Often, if you were on them long enough, you saw that progression. And you see that now Absolutely. still on the internet too. You know, you see like first guys like, hey, "Hey, you know, I'm new here," and they're kind of nervous or whatever. Or maybe they come across the court, but you know, they here's their, my first thing, and then you know, after a while, they're like, "Oh, this is whoever," and they're great and they do their thing, you know, and like, but you can kind of follow their first introduction, Absolutely. their first you know self introduction. Yeah, and I mean, you know, some of the people on the boards, like when you're saying that, I think of like Dan Johansson, Sewer Election. Like he was on the boards back then. Right. We were trading tapes. I did some releases with him on Contradict early on, like, and still going and still active and still making amazing material, right? So it's fun to see that and and see it kind of in real time when you're when you're there and just keep hearing this stuff from people. And yeah. I still have a lot of stuff from that era that was just you just traded with everybody at least i felt like and i've maybe fallen a bit out of that in the past few years i still trade with friends i still give stuff to friends whatever but back then it was also new and exciting and and no one knew who you were or what you sounded like so they there was a curiosity to it that was exciting. yeah that's true that's that's a big part of it i think that i haven't really thought of is people are more hesitant to trade nowadays which i think is due to a number of factors. I know I am too. I still try to, but, but one of the factors maybe that, you know, I, f- I feel like I'm more interested to, tr- to trade with someone who I can't find anything about, you know, like yeah, if someone's yeah, like it, approaching me like, yeah, I have thing to trade. I, I, but if, if you know, you can, you can check it out first and find the band camp and check the links, then you're going to be more able to be like filtered. Oh, I don't know if I want it or whatever. But if someone really approaches you and you have no idea what they sound like, but something about their, the way they present themselves or their title, even just their name, you know, that's all huge is like intriguing. Then you might, you might, you might find a really good trade. Yeah. And a name and presentation is really important to me. I I would much rather get a tape in the mail with a cover than a band camp link. If someone wants me to check something out or whatever. Now for personal listening, it, it's like 50, 50. Well, I'd, I'd like to listen to a download for convenience, but also I like to right. throw a tape in the tape deck, whatever. But I don't know. There's something about getting that package, that letter that makes it feel a bit more tangible. So I always appreciate when For someone sure. goes the extra step and, and just sends a tape. Absolutely. And that's, I think I've talked about this numerous times in the podcast, but not in a while. That's And people ask about that sometimes, you know, how do I get people to listen to my stuff? If you offer to send someone, if, if you just send someone something. Right. The chance of them <laughs> listening to it is like... 10, at least 10 times greater than sending them a link. Right, right. Yeah. It is. It's And it's funny because it's so much easier to just click on the link. But then you click on the link and you preview 30 seconds of it and go, oh, all right, I get what this is. Whereas if I'm putting a tape in, I'm not going to probably get up and stop the tape. I'm going to let it run, right? And so right. maybe everybody else feels like that. Maybe they don't. But that's how my brain works with it. For sure. Um, you mentioned the boards and you mentioned the Tronics board. Was the Tronics board around at that time before you got involved in it? Because I, I always knew of the Tronics board being the Tronics Chondritic sound board. There was a point at which Phil and I were in such constant communication that we just decided to merge the boards. I believe there was, or merge or make the board together. Um, oh. So the Tronics board was around before I was involved with it. And Tronics was one of the first labels I started ordering from way back when and visiting his old website and, and just 
being really excited about getting that stuff. And so I don't remember exactly at what point or how it came to be now. Phil might have a better recollection, but we just decided to combine the boards. We were talking a lot. Uh, I was doing some releases with his label. We were, you know, just in really constant communication back then. And I, at a point, started hosting the board when we got it off Easy Board. So I was handling all the technical stuff and mm-hmm. maintaining the the board software and moderating and doing all that stuff. And I had a back then a, a job where I sat at a desk eight hours a day doing IT work. So it was really, I was on the board a lot. I could be on the board at work. I yeah. could <laughs> be editing uh, something for the board or moderating. And it just looked like work to anyone walking by or, you know, maybe not yeah. like work, but if I had a, like a terminal open or something, no one, no one knew what was going on. So yeah, it made yeah. it really easy to be really active all the time then. And as my, yeah workload change and I got busier with that kind of stuff and the board got busier. It got a lot harder to manage. Yeah. How do you reflect? I was going to ask you about all the board and stuff later, but that, but this is a really fascinating topic, but how do you reflect on that board now? Like that was such, for me personally, that was such an important instrument and place for discovering about all this stuff. How do you, how do you, how do you look back on it now? You know, and, and it's life and the whole thing. Yeah, likewise. I, I'm happy to hear you say that, but I, I, it was really important to me at the time because I was so involved, right? It was I was putting stuff out constantly. I was interacting with people constantly. There was great resources to talk about equipment, and that's where I learned a lot of the stuff <laughs> that I know now and, and probably yeah. bought a lot of the gear that I use now is just get, having people reference stuff, having people tell you about great stuff. There was also the the uh i can't noisegear.com whatever right the the website right. that bob scott yep. was running that was keeping reviews of this stuff so we were talking about that there was tons of stuff for show promotion right we had like regional sections for yeah. show promoting yeah. there was of course a now playing recent listening thing where everyone would talk about their new yeah. favorites and what they just got yeah people were yeah everyone was posting everything there if they had a new release out you could find out about any new release on any label you liked about, I felt like because it would get posted there. Exactly. So that was like one of the main places to put that stuff and to have people actually respond to it. It was, but the after a place. while it got a bit out of hand. That was like more trolly, more jokey, more people just trying to provoke or trying to get some reaction or being spammy or being goofy in the interest of their fun, yeah. which fine. But it got to be more to moderate or interact with. It just felt like it was kind of falling apart from what I like to see. And it was also around that time that I was moving from Michigan to California when we, when we decided to shut it down. So there was, it was a lot more to manage than I could manage with my new life here. And, uh, in a, I've thought about this a lot over the years in a way I, I really regret shutting down, the board because first off there were people that got angry i got outright like messages that were mad at me for taking away a a valuable resource um and i understand that i and i get it now back then i didn't because they weren't the ones running it they weren't the ones paying for it they weren't the ones moderating it they weren't the ones dealing with it all the time they weren't the ones having to upgrade it when a new update came out any of that stuff but there was a lot of stuff there that I feel like hasn't really been captured anywhere else, anywhere that's popped up since then in terms of forums. Maybe it was the time culturally too, that like people have kind of moved on from boards, but there's still boards kicking and there's still a lot of activity on them. They're just different places than I feel like that forum was. So I don't know. It was so centralized. Yeah. And and the thing is, I don't know if I'd go, I don't know if I would go to that forum today. Right. Like, I don't know if I, if if it existed outside of me, I don't know if I would be on that board now, but at the time I was on it (laughs) just constantly, like every day I I had to be, it felt like, and it was also really central to like what I was doing with the label and why I was releasing so much and how I was able to sell so much of that stuff back then and how I became in 
contact with so many different people was yeah. just from that place. And that's true for a lot of people. There's, I, there's so many splits, collabs, friendships, tours oh, forged yeah. because of that board. And it's a little wild to think about it in retrospect, just because it was such a massive thing that is, is gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it, I mean, I think it really is a shame that it's gone because even if it weren't active anymore, I can, th I, I, I frequently think back to information or stories or stuff that I read on, you know, that I have in my mind. I'm like, where did I hear that again? And I'm like, Oh yeah, that was on the, the Tronix board. And it's like, I can't, right. I can't, I can't find it anymore. I was, or I'm, I'm trying to double check something I remember reading on there and it's like, Oh man, but it was so full of it because everyone was on there really. Yeah. For I mean, years, I had an archive of it. I had it, all the files and everything still in one place. And I was kind of joking about like one day, April fool's day or something, you know, just like turning it back on, <laughs> just like <laughs> the boards back. Right. Right. Is it, you know, just dusty from whatever, like the plastic on the furniture and everything. Yeah. Um, and that might've been interesting to see where it would go, but it, it's also just so sort of mired in my relationship and history with it, that it's, a funny thing to have to deal with. And I, and I just yeah. can't do it, you know, but there was, yeah, yeah, there's so much great information. So I would love to go back and see, and someone years ago, I was trying to like archive all the chondritic stuff and Chris Sienko helped me out with that a lot, but I was looking for all the like press new release blurbs that I'd written for releases over the years. Like every description yeah. I'd had of something when it was coming out and like, those are all on the board. <laughs> Those would have all been there. I would have posted everything there. Yeah. Um, and so exactly. it's like, do you have any of these in like an old email or something you can find? But it's, I didn't think about it then, but like those would have all been on the board along with everybody else's new release postings from the mid two thousands. Right. Like, yeah. And it's fun to see who responded. Maybe who was listening to what 15 years ago or sure. more like, yeah, it's, there was a lot of, great information and again the shows for booking shows and for touring and that stuff it helped make so many contacts for me Absolutely. and for many other people so yeah. that part was really cool too is just the not just the trading and whatever scene but the actual physical networking of planning tours and stuff that went from you know years before i started touring having to have an atlas or you know my first tour we printed stuff from MapQuest and put it in yeah. a three ring binder yeah to, yeah where we've been now where everyone can contact everyone and everyone knows somebody in other cities at that interim right. period, having the board to meet people, you go to the, whatever the Midwest forum and be like, Oh, I'm trying to book some shows. Where should I play? And then you get answers like, I'll book you a show in Indiana, whatever. Yeah. So exactly. that part of it was, was really central too. I'm sure there are people, I'm sure for some people, maybe for everyone, it's good that it's gone. Cause I think, People got to close off a chapter of their maybe younger years where they were loudmouths or whatever on the internet. Myself included. Know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's also it, right? That's like a, a past version of a lot of us that maybe we don't, we remember the parts, certain parts of fondly and other parts we don't want to remember. So it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's difficult to separate myself from it as it was something I was so involved in, but. I really, especially in, in recent years and especially even doing noise extra and other podcast stuff that, you know, that are like listening to the history of this stuff and people's history, yeah. I hear the board mentioned, I have people talk to me yeah. about it and I realize what kind of a resource it was that maybe I didn't see when I was sick of it. Totally. Yeah. Do you think something like that is missing today? Some sort of, I mean, do you think... Instagram is a is a sufficient replacement for that kind of place. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think that Instagram or even Facebook has quite the same impact as the board did. But I don't know if it's just because culturally we've moved on from that sort of thing. And and I think that is a big part of it. Is that and maybe maybe the board dying was also part of that in terms of noise networking and stuff. But it, it f seems like less pe people are less likely to hang out on a forum these days. Yeah. So I don't know what 
if it were still around, that it would be a useful tool in the same way that it was, aside from historically and, and for the information that is there. I just don't know that it would have the same functionality. And that was, I think, what I was starting to see when I was getting sick of it and, and thinking about shutting it down was that it had gone from this sort of useful resource to a place where we had a lot of jokesters and trolls and, and whatever that was fine, but not something I wanted to continue dealing with. Yeah. But I mean, with all the new kind of platforms popping up, I mean, there's like, there's a new social media every, every, every couple months. It seems like that, you know, yeah. for example, there's discord, which is kind of like, do you think some sort of maybe upgraded or updated network could be used or useful that? Absolutely. But it's, everything's too decentralized now. Every, like you said, there's yeah. a new social media. Every time something happens on Twitter, it's like, Oh, I've I signed up for my new account on whatever new site. And yeah. in a month, no one's using it or you right. know, a handful of people. And it happens constantly now to where the entrenched things like the Facebook, Instagram discord is doing well, but every single person has a discord server, right? Like right. anyone can have a discord server. So yeah. how do you, make that a play how do you make the one where everybody's going to go and how do they find out about it and so that's part of the problem is that it's it's great that everything is so widespread and accessible but there's no one pivotal location for a lot of that stuff and not that the tronics board was the pivotal location but there you know oh, there were was. other boards or other things around it but if you went to that one you could find a lot of things and you could find out about the other ones and i Maybe I'm just yeah. out of touch, but I don't know the noise Discord to go to. Someone recently invited me to one, and they do some cool like streaming thing where everybody on Monday does a like a live set or presents something, and like they do time yeah. slots, and that's like a really cool community idea yeah. for that. But it's not a thousand people on there or whatever, right? It's right. everything is individualized in a smaller thing. So yeah, the massive scope of it, I think is gone. It's impossible to have something that's sort of that major. And any of these other social media places that try to replace the kind of juggernauts we know are also just not getting the same kind of numbers. Cause why, why would they, why am I going to go to this site when I'm already here, even though this place sucks, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to see it. I would love to see somewhere that you could go to find that stuff. And there's a couple of good Facebook groups that are like right. the, you know, the noise now playing and that kind of stuff that are yeah. really interesting and you can find out about new stuff and people talk and there is community there. Yeah. But that also requires being on Facebook and looking right. at that stupid thing. And that's a turn yeah, off exactly. to a lot of people these days too. And that that's the beauty of the forums is that it was so bare bones and, you know, non commercial. Yeah. If you had and, a web browser you could you could go and you could make an account. You didn't need anything more than an email address and a web browser, right? So Anyone exactly. can go on there. You don't need to install Discord. You don't need to sign up for a stupid Facebook account or whatever. It's just you, you can just yeah. go and be a part of it. And the way it's set up is also much more conducive to conversation, specific conversation. You know, I have a Discord and it's cool, but even that, like, you have – I don't have a million topics for everything. So it's like a, a forum. You can say, let's make a topic about this band and then we can have a – trillion answers about that band yeah and then yeah, it's more easily, thread oriented right yeah it can be easily found i mean that's the thing about like that the forums are great because you can easily find an organized bit of a discussion um yeah. you know there are there are a couple of good forums there's a special interest forum there's scream and rise Absolutely. and i would love to see, i mean they're they're kind of separate for certain reasons and i won't maybe go into that but it seems like people keep Keep people kind of keep in different camps for for whatever reasons. Yeah, and I love that about the the Tronics country f sound form is that it was so it was had these separate camps within it, but it was still very unified. I think that's what is missing. Let's go back now and talk more about kind of Chondritic as a label and also how your project Hive Mind fit into that timeline. Sure. Activity. <laughs> Two thousand. Two Chondritic sort of starts uh, with a couple small releases. I th had gotten some three inches from somewhere and I thought they were the coolest thing. And so <laughs> I just, that was like how, you know, wh how, what I thought I found a place to source them. I found 
some with cases I like, and I just started going and working in an office at the time, had access to nice color printers, so I was just printing stuff off there. Uh, in the later years, I would be burning off a lot of the CDs there on like the CD burning towers, cool. but starting out, it was just spray paint in my garage, trying to assemble some releases. I know the first Black Sand Desert was sort of the first, I mean, the first project that I had that was, that I did a, a kind of real release for. And okay. the first Black Sand Desert CD, I remember I, I, they're all numbered and I wrote down who got which number because I was sending them out mostly in trades. So yeah. a while ago I found the list of who got which number uh, on like an old hard drive that I was like archiving stuff off of. And it's really funny to look back and see who I was in touch with then and who I was trying to trade with or send stuff to. But cool. it was such a small level that I, I could keep track of that. Right. I made, I made 17 of those. So I knew, yeah. I knew where they went. Yeah. And it just started growing from there. You know, you send somebody some stuff and then, well, I don't, put out enough or record enough material to maintain a label. So if I want to do more than just a vanity label of my stuff, I got to start asking other people and you get excited about other people's noise. Right. So yeah. I was really excited about a couple of different things. And especially like, like I said, seeing Cornucopia, Jorge Castro's project, seeing that and it was really good. I was really excited. I met the guy. He was really nice. And so I wanted to put something out and, I, putting out someone who I just met stuff that I had seen and liked, it felt like a, a big deal. Like he was from yeah. Puerto Rico. This wasn't, you know, yeah. it was, it, it moved it outside of me in Detroit trying to put out some stuff. I, I like did something by an artist from somewhere else. And right. that kind of continued too, because you're in touch with so many people. So it was a lot of making stuff. And I had tried to do a label before Chondritic that kind of did a couple releases, but they never really got out there. The quality wasn't very good. It was like a, a thing that was stopped very quickly and then kind of replaced by this. And that was sort of around the time I was doing stuff with uh, the webzine and everything. I was like trying to do a label, but mm -hmm. I had, I think, the wrong ideas about it. So moving into Chondritic, I had a clear idea and more examples of what I wanted to do. And... So yeah, it was just getting in touch with people from the bulletin board, getting in touch with other friends, you know, putting out some stuff by like Red Rot, who I was had friends with before the label started and and we'd go to shows together and jam together. Um, yeah. and just trying to foster something there. And alongside the board, it's impossible to not mention that because it was a big place right. of finding new artists, meeting new people yeah. to work with, meeting people from other places to trade with. And it's also funny, one of the places that, I, that doesn't get talked about so much, but I met a, kind of a lot of people was SoulSeek mm. back then. You know, you, you would True. download something, you'd start some conversation with someone who had some rare tape. And back then, even rarer, right? Because mm. <laughs> right. we didn't have Discogs in our face and all this stuff like we do now. Right. And so you would just have these cool conversations and learn about stuff from people or they'd recommend something else. And... Hive Mind was born out of getting my MS-20, which is sitting right there, of course. Same um, one. Same one, yeah. It's uh, seen better days and been supplanted for traveling with a couple different things, but mm -hmm. it's still my favorite thing. And yeah, once I got it, I, I, I mean, I immediately just fell in love with the sounds and... Versus being harsh, I, I wanted to do, and some of that early high mind stuff is still pretty harsh, but I wanted to do something right. just more atmospheric. A lot of the drone, I was listening to tons of Loki Foundation, Malignant Records, like stuff in that realm, some of the Tesco stuff, MB, and MB and Daniel Menchie are two projects that I often cite as being very instrumental for Hive Mind, as Menchie's textures were yeah. mind blowing to me. Just the kind of sound that he was sculpting then was really really magical and the misery of mb just not yeah. even being able to understand how to play and not play something 
like that. Just yeah, there's a detachedness to it that I really love, and so I wanted. To, I, I started Hive Mind, and Hive Mind was a uh, name of a Black Sand Desert track on a split. I did with Clue of Theseus. So oh, cool. just kind of took it from there. I think those pieces were maybe a little dronier for Black Sand Desert. So when I decided to start the project, that was that was the option. And my first I, I think my first show as Hive Mind was opening for Wolf Eyes and Emil Bolio at uh, I wanna say maybe a place called Logger House in Detroit. Awesome. Um at the time, in, in like 2003, I was going through a breakup and I was looking for a new place to live. And I ended up moving in with Aaron Dillaway. So today for the Patreon, I'm giving away a copy of this CD, Elysian Alarms by Hive Mind, his most recent album. I have five copies to give away to the first five new Patreon supporters that sign up after this episode airs. And the first five people who increase their level of support. So if you up your tier, you will get a copy in the mail. Or if you sign up new, you get a copy in the mail. The first five people who do this. For the Maniac Circle, Gray has shared some audio from his recent Black Sand Desert live set at Coaxial in Los Angeles. As well as Bandcamp download codes for Elysian Alarms. For the heavy sponsors and noise fiends, I like to give away merch there too. I've got three copies of the Hive Mind Elysian Alarms remix album. Featuring remixes by Aaron Dillaway, Silent Servant, Codex Empire, Youth Code, John Weeson, Oil Thief. Three of these go to the first three people who comment on the post that will go up after this episode airs live. So if you're watching live, which you should, there'll be a post at the end. First three people to comment get that LP for free. As you know, we're trying to get the Patreon to reach 300 supporters. We're at about 263 last time I checked. At 300 supporters, I'm going to put into production this three CD compilation I'm working on of artists that have been on the podcast. Um, the RSVP list is pretty insane. It's going to be most of the people that have been on the podcast already. I've got a lot of tracks already. They're, they're still rolling in. The final lineup will be announced October 19th once all the tracks are in and I know exactly who's going to be on it. But you can rest assured it's going to be serious. That's going to be only available to Patreon supporters and only go into production once we hit 300. So make sure you sign up. Make sure you get your copy. In other exciting news... Emil Bolio, in the Pale Moonlight tape reissue of the tape that Henry Mallard put out when he was 12 years old in 2011. That was brand new Emil Bolio material at the time. Ron was in retirement for several years at that point, but he decided to come out of retirement to record this album for Henry's new label at that time, Pale Moon Productions. Um, there was quite a story to how that all went down. Uh, we're finally putting this all together. Henry, me, and Ron, kind of as it was intended to be. This version has an eight-page booklet with photos and liner notes from Henry, Henry's mother, and Ron talking about the process, recalling the story. There will also be a Emil Bolio umbrella available at that time. That's going to be a yellow umbrella printed with Ron's signature handwriting, Emil Bolio in the Pale Moonlight. Those are available to the public uh, early September when I have everything on hand. Maniac Circle supporters and Noise Fiend supporters of the podcast can pre-order them now. So if you're on the Patreon at either one of those levels, you can shoot me an email and I'll put you down for one and make sure you get one when they're out. There's an extended segment of the interview that you're watching now on Patreon where Gray goes into great detail about his synths and gear and general recording process for Hive Mind and Black Sand Desert. So if you're into hearing about that kind of stuff, it's definitely not to miss. And on that note, I just decided for the hell of it to plug this magazine, this zine that just arrived. Um, I just opened it up a few minutes ago and looked through it and just thought it's so cool. I have to share the news about it. Uh, It's called The Vital Organ. Finnish magazine, and it's details from handful of artists about their gear and process so it's filled with fantastic pictures of their gear synths pedals and detailed interview questions about their gear i haven't read it yet but i just cracked it open and am totally blown away by it i think it's really really well done so i just felt like sharing the word about that that'll be in the next 
distro update for White Centipede Noise. The mail order will be closing at the end of September. I'm making a trip to the United States to visit family for a couple months. So the distro will be closed. There'll be some really great new White Centipede Noise releases dropping before then. The Emil Bolio tape and Umbrella is one of them, but there are many more. So keep an eye out for that stuff. And uh, thank you all for your support. Enjoy the rest of the episode and talk to you soon. Uh -huh. um, and so, and we'd talked at shows a bunch and I'd seen Universal Indians and Wolf Eyes play and seen Dillaway solo. And we'd been talking and I, I remember going to the place to like meet with him and see if I'd be a good roommate fit or whatever. And I'm just, I'm waiting for him to show up and I'm looking through the, the window and there's a wall through through the like window in the door. You can see like this wall of VHS tapes and then there's yeah. like a bookshelf next to the couch. And uh, I think I brought pizza and like a two liter of Coke. I'm like, Hey, I got uh, your new, <laughs> your new roommate. Here's some pizza and Coke. And uh, then he shows up, we go in and we're hanging out and we're talking. He shows me the room. It's a shitty little room. <laughs> and uh but i just i need to move there's a basement there's a skate ramp in the basement uh nice. and and it's like a kind of you know whatever 20 something kind of party house there's a nice backyard yeah. and i remember we sit down eat some pizza and uh he's like you into man of war and then throws in <laughs> man of war hell on earth and we're just sitting there and i'm like yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna move in here <laughs> like, <"This> is great. <laughs> and uh that was another big thing is like at the time, Aaron was working at Encore Records, and he would stock the Chondritic stuff. And he was running oh, cool. the Hanson mail order, which I ended up doing the like web programming for. I'd programmed the Chondritic store. I'd learned HTML and and had yeah. like figured out some some stuff, some PHP stuff, whatever, to code the Chondritic site. And then I did the Hanson catalog. So I was helping Aaron with that, and he was doing a lot of mail order at the time. Yeah. And so he was also selling my stuff and that helped get it into, I think, new ears as well. But yeah, the first, first hive mind show, uh, was really awkward and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I played under like a tarp or blanket cause I didn't want to be seen. <laughs> and, uh, I wish I could remember what he said because I asked Ron what he thought of my set and he was, uh, honest and, <laughs> Not incredibly uh, polite <laughs> about yeah. it, which is that's his way. No? I don't think I, I don't think it was very good, but <laughs> there's a, I think there's a recording. I think the Writhing Flesh tape was a recording of the first two live shows, uh, which was later reissued by Tone Filth on LP. Okay, um, but looking back on that stuff, it was it was just figuring it out. You know, yeah, uh, I, I probably had no idea what I was doing, and. Hive Mind quickly became the main thing that I was doing. I, I have put out very little Black Sand Desert material over the years, even though it's my first project. And even though I really enjoy making harsh noise, yeah, I, it's really got to hit me as something when I record it that I that I want to get out there. And sure. Hive Mind felt really effortless. I would sit in front of my gear and the things I would make, I would really like how they sounded, just right. always. And around that time at least in terms of people I knew, there were not a lot of people using synths in their noise. The stuff I was right. seeing was pedal based. The stuff I was seeing was like junk based or circuit bent kind of stuff. And yep. there weren't too many things using a synth. And so I think at that time it was a little unique. Not to say that, I mean, obviously people have been using synths in noise forever, but sure. around then, they were kind of expensive. They were, or they had already, you'd already broken them. Like Dillaway had synths, but they were, you know, some of them were in like rough shape and needed repair and getting a synth repaired costs a good amount of money. Yeah. 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 So I, it had a little bit of something to it that took it, that at least made people respond to it. That was a little different. Yeah. Um, that was a question from a patron from the maniac circles. What, well, what was your first synth? You just told us that. And how did you get started using synths for noise? Hear Gray go into depth about his synths, gear, and general recording process for Hive Mind and Black Sand Desert in the extended segment of this interview at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Uh, why did you move from Michigan to California? I was dating a girl at the time who was from out here, and she was living with me in Michigan, and 
continually encouraging me that I would I would flourish in California. I would uh, I would love it there. I was friends with Phil and John yeah. Weiss and Damien Romero, and of course a ton of other people from out here. You know, like Sixes yeah. up in the Bay, and just yeah. had a lot of friends out here. And Damien was also when I was thinking of moving here. Damien was like every week. When are you moving to L.A.? When are you coming to L.A.? Yeah. So in 2009, uh, I came out here as my father was uh, sick with cancer. And so in 2009, mm-hmm. I came out here for a little vacation and then went up to visit him. And then uh, in 2010, well, in late 2009, I got laid off from my job. And I didn't really like my job at the point, and I didn't really love living in Detroit then. And yeah. this idea was already in my head, so just started making it happen. And April 2010, I moved out here, just packed up everything in a moving van and moved out here to a one-bedroom apartment with two cats and my girlfriend. We split up less than six months after getting out here. Uh, Oy. And I was like functionally homeless for about four months, like sleeping on couches, hammocks, friends' places, uh, most of my stuff in a storage unit, and just sort of dealing with that. And all of that kind of move to L.A. coincided with the label kind of falling apart at that time, too. There was a Mm -hmm. big break in releases. I was already bad at mail order by that time. I was from the kind of like mid to late... 2000s i was on drugs i was drinking a lot and i wasn't being very responsible with my money my time uh, other people's money in terms of like stuff i was doing with the label and moving to la was also part of trying to get away from that and maybe get a fresh start get away from bad influences uh get away from easy connections get away from sort of a past that i had had that i wasn't very happy about but right. at the same time, it also screwed up a lot of things because, like I said, moved here and then just didn't didn't have kind of anything <laughs> going on. So yeah, yeah, I was working some shit jobs. I was doing construction. I was do- working the door at a club here, like doing whatever I could to kind of make ends meet yeah. and try to reestablish things back yeah. then. Yeah. So now moved that to LA was through that. I mean, the first year I lived in Los Angeles was the worst year of my life, and it's only been up yeah. since then. Yeah, the the okay. can safely say there was a lot of good there. I met I met a lot of awesome people. I had a lot of fun. I have really fond memories from that time. But yeah. I was broke on food stamps, selling off my record collection to make ends meet. Uh, yeah, begging, got couch from friends, and just really desperate and miserable. And uh, yeah. people were really mad at me for not sending their packages on the internet and stuff. So there was also uh-huh. this like other thing of like something that I was part of that was very important to me. I had fucked up and I couldn't, I couldn't fix it. I, I couldn't, I could barely right. eat. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't fixing right. anything. Um, yeah. And th- so at that time, yeah, it was, it was a bad, it was a bad time that I only wanted to rectify and slowly yeah. started doing that with a lot of help from John Weiss who would have me over to his place and we would like work on stuff. So I would get, I would go to my storage unit and get out like the tapes for the steel trap comp, which is one of the big things that kind of got screwed over in that process. And I would like make 10 copies or whatever and try to mail them out with the money I had and then just keep kind of doing that thing over and over and having someone there to kind of motivate. And also we, up until John left LA, we would still do this. We would get together and we would have like, we'd call it work day and we would just work on, either something collaboratively or separate things together just to have the like motivation and focus of being in the same place, working on something and throw a movie on and then, you know, in the background and just hang out and make stuff. Yeah. And uh, that even doing that, whatever, 13 years ago, it really helped me a lot, get back on my feet and kind of establish myself again. And then, yeah, I made a lot of great connections here in LA, including uh, Pete majors at vacation vinyl, who, ultimately hired me to work at the record store and but it was also the second day I was in LA I think I met him 
um, certainly, certainly that first week, but I think it was like the second or third day I was in LA and it was like, Oh yeah, bring some of your stuff by, like, we'll sell your stuff in the shop, blah, 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 like immediate connection. And then to us, like he was also one of the people letting me stay on his couch for extended periods of time, the most gracious host and, uh, nice. and giving me a job of vacation, which gave me a little bit of money, the connections I found to get my own plate, you know, room to stay at and the, uh, the ability to kind of start doing Chondritic again a little bit later and, and start wanting to be involved with that. It's funny when it left, it felt very strange and I just wanted it. Uh, I just wanted it back. You know, you get sick of something. Yeah. Like we we're talking about the board. It's like, you're maybe, you're maybe tired of something. And then when it's gone, you're like, mm, you, you have that realization of what a part of your life it was. And so sure. in the sense, it never really left is either something I was stressed out about or something that I was looking forward to doing again. Yeah. I mean, that's a long I, I, answer for how I wound up in LA, but that's the that's the gist no, of like no, getting out here and figuring out my place out here. Yeah, I, I mean, it, most big moves are something like that, and they're they're complicated. And they can be life changing. They usually are life changing in big ways, and you know have lots of ups ups and downs in them. But um, sounds like it's a good. I mean, you probably a good move, right? Oh yeah, I love it? it out here. I can't imagine this is where I've lived now the longest aside from, you know, when I, whatever, when I was with my parents until I lived with them until I was 18. And I always wanted to move out <laughs> of my parents' place and just yeah. get away from that. And so this is the, now the longest I've lived anywhere is in Los Angeles. And I love it here. This is uh, the place I live now is also the place I've lived the longest in terms of like anywhere in my entire life. This is where I've spent the most of my like a house or apartment. Yeah. I've got a two bedroom house here. It's like part of a duplex. Uh, and nice. yeah, it's, it's great. This room has all my records and gear in it. And then there's like another bedroom behind me. That's got an actual bed in it. <laughs> that's, that's but, lux. That's luxury. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it's a little too small for all the stuff I have, but finding a place in Los Angeles now that will fit all of this in any way that I could afford is not going to happen. Yeah, at so, least not without major lifestyle changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been so active in all your stuff. I mean, I know you're involved in other music. It's not so strictly just noise, but I mean, what what role has that played for you in your life? I mean in terms of a positive role. Yeah. I don't how know much any other way. Private personal life has it taken over. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know any other way to do it. Uh, I need to stay busy. I always have yeah. some kind of projects going on. I can be bad at finishing them, but I always have something happening. Uh, I am, I make noise almost every day or I'm involved with it in some way. Like I can come in here and even if it's just listening to my synth droning and playing with the delay a bit or whatever, that kind of stuff is a constant for me and what I do to relax. Right. So like yeah. reading, working on things, making releases, doing noise extra. Those are, those are all just, I wouldn't know any other way to do it now. It's been 20 plus years of this being my life and almost all of my like, close friends were met through this scene. There's a handful of other people who aren't quite from the noise scene, but who have been involved in it or, you know, are aware of it's it in terms of that orbit. But the majority of my social circle is people I know because of this, whether or not they still do it or they're still involved right. in it or whatever. It's just like this thing of that's, that's what I've been doing for 20 years. I don't, I don't, have a ton of other interests outside of noise and art, you know, music like yeah. that's, that's what right. I find myself spending my time on. And I, I'm someone that needs to stay busy. I, I feel weird if there's not something for me to be working on, um, yeah. for better or worse, it causes a lot of problems too, because I'm always, trying to do new things. I get really scattered and start yeah. new things. And th then they kind of sit in a 90% finished state until I feel like going back to them. So 
Sure. It's something I'm <laughs> still dealing with. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I noise has been one of the best things that ever happened to me in terms of it's I spend hours a week just talking about it with my friends. Right. I mean, yeah. doing doing the podcast, you know, it's like this is yeah. really fun. We get to sit and talk with people we like and respect about yeah. the thing we care about. <laughs> and I get to do that all yeah. the time. That's Absolutely. like most of what yeah. my day is. And if it's not on the podcast, yeah. it's like text messages with friends or uh, you know, Instagram messages or whatever kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Where, yeah, yeah, I'm just getting to soak in this world and hear about this stuff and get excited about this stuff. I'm still excited about it. There's a tape that's supposed to show up today that I'm really excited about. <laughs> I'm going to listen to it yeah. when, whenever the mailman gets here. Like, that's that's what's on my agenda today. Uh, I'm playing a show on Sunday. And so like last night had band practice felt amazing about running through the set a few times and figuring out a couple things and also really excited to get back to recording once we're done with the show prep. So yeah. it's Hell just yeah. the, the thing I got doing an interview tomorrow, doing an interview Saturday and like, that's cool. It, I can't wait. I'm really excited. And there's a lot yeah. of prep work in terms of that stuff sometimes. So that's also fun is like pulling out the zines, reading through old articles, hitting the way back machine, like yeah. that kind of stuff. It's still, yeah, it's still noise, right? I'm still like doing something noise related when I'm doing that. So it's, it's fun. Yeah. I Fuck yeah. can't separate it from it. I, there's people who come and go in this stuff. You see that they take breaks for five years, 10 years, and then come back. Yeah. Uh, there's people who make great noise and then just kind of disappear. Disappear. I can't, and I've had my, I guess my period of that, right. When I was talking about the move here and kind of being out of it for a couple of years, yeah. but it, it was still a thing I was doing even behind the scenes. And I can't imagine it not being a part of my life. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have noise in my life. I, I really don't know what, what would I do? <laughs> yeah. What else is there to do? How yeah. do, how do other people yeah. not do this all the time? I know. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I know what you mean quite, quite, quite closely. So you mentioned noise extra, and that's obviously a huge part of what you do nowadays. Um, I want to talk to you about that, but I also want to first talk to you about MERSCast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about MERSCast, what that was, and how it evolved, and what happened with MERSCast. Uh, MERSCast was born out of the the simple idea of there's a million Mertzbau records, and wouldn't it be fun to talk about them as an excuse to listen to one every week also, right? Like as an excuse yeah. to just an exercise in listening and focusing and detailing the nuance, but also I can't remember if it was around the same time or not. I think of it as maybe an inspiration. Um, my friend Adam Higgins had sent me a podcast that was just about uh, the films of Jim Varney, AKA Ernest P. Worrell, right? <laughs> And they were like breaking these things down and getting really into the detailed minutia of these movies. And so sort of doing an, a podcast like that of let's focus on this thing. Let's just, we could just have it and it's, it can talk about this and we can, I can talk to my different friends. I'll go to shows. We'd start talking about a record, you know, talk about a merch about record, talk about whatever. And it's, it's like, we should just record this. So trying yeah. to start doing that was, I was really it of, yeah, let's do it. And like, of course, Connolly, right? Like my, my buddy who we always talk about noise, it's all, all our conversations are usually predicated on. Let's do that. And uh, it was really fun and really exciting. And then we start to get some really great guests. Yeah. GX, Philip Best, Russell Haswell, uh, Bill Hudson, you know, like Jim Harris. We had cool guests on the podcast to talk about this stuff and we had more planned and it was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, there was also like the wire did like a thing about it. Like it got hyped up really fast of us. Yeah. And then also the guys that were going through the Merce box. And uh -huh. then there was this, like, I think misunderstanding <laughs> that happened with Masami, uh, due to his preferences and, and goals these days comparative to what he's done in the past. And I guess his idea or understanding of what our podcast was doing. And mm -hmm. 
so we decided to instead focus on we'd already actually kind of before that we'd already even recorded an episode and had the idea for noise extra it was going to be a side project side thing of Mercast is like we're 13 episodes deep or whatever we need to like let's yeah. talk about I want to talk about MSBR right I want to talk about yeah. Masana I want to talk about this kind of stuff so we'd already had this idea and so when it ended we needed a little time to regroup and kind of figure out if we wanted to continue doing Mercast even with kind of what was going on or if we wanted to start something new and we already had this new thing so it was just kind of figuring out the name. I think we'd had the name Noise Extra, but we tried we tried out something for like a week where we were going to call it like Noise World or something and in terms yeah. of like a Mombuis, like a reference to, you know, the English translation of that or whatever. All right. Yeah. Um it, and I I'm glad we landed on Noise Extra. It just made the most sense. And yeah. uh that's that's where we are now, right? I mean, that started and it's just again talking about this stuff, but also getting to just do interviews and getting to, and we've obviously leaned even more into that of like talking to people. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, again, I keep saying exciting, but it is every day I get to talk to someone or we line up some new interview and we talk to people and get to hear their philosophy, their thoughts on noise, their history with it, how they got started. It's not too different for a lot of us. A lot of people, you know, of certain ages come to this stuff through the same paths and that yeah. makes sense, but it's, I'm never bummed when we're, when it's time to do an interview, it's like always an exciting thing. So yeah, it's always different. Yeah. It's always different and it's always exciting. I mean, there's, there's just, there, there's like a couple clear through lines for everyone of a certain age group or a certain time period in terms of culturally too, right. Where you get into this yeah. stuff and right. like we just did that episode with Drew McDowell and he talks about seeing suicide <laughs> and the Ramones like in the same yeah. period of time and that being an inspiration. It's yeah. like, yeah, that's not something I could have ever <laughs> done, you know, but yeah. it's an awesome like way to get inspired to start a band and start and start making music. And so it's Mercast was really fun and it was a lot of fun doing these sort of detailed listenings and focusing on a single artist with such a vast catalog and whose work yeah. I still love very, very much and, and still listen to. But in a way, Merzcast turning into Noise Extra was for the better because we get to do so much now, so much more. Like it was really, at the time, it felt like a big deal or a weird kind of hit. And now it's like, well, I'm really thankful for the way everything has progressed because now we, we just get oh, to do sure. this stuff. And it's been four years of this now, like with weekly yeah. episodes. And it's a, it's a lot and it's a, it takes up a, a good yeah, chunk yeah. of time, but it's, it's so cool and it's so awesome to even go back and listen to some of the episodes and think of the people we've talked to and think of the kind of information yeah. that is rattling around in not just my head, but plenty of other people's heads now about this stuff. So it must be fulfilling. I mean, I, I can imagine it's very fulfilling. I mean, you, yeah, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. you also do yeah. this. So, you know, it's like, it, it's just, yeah. it has this strange reward to it. And I know it's not for everyone and I know, Maybe our interview episodes are for people and maybe our review episodes are for people, the, those kind of things. Um, but you don't, you can pick and choose what to listen to and, and there's something there for everybody, I think. So. Absolutely. And so I think it's, it's definitely, what I mean, most fun. I think Merce Cast was a, was a great concept and it was a lot of fun, but at some point you might've said, okay. Um, well, you, like you said, you had side episodes kind of planned already because you were like, yeah, okay, we'd already we had, before any of this happened, we'd already met and recorded a side episode <laughs> that was going to be like a Patreon yeah. thing or something, you know, it was going to just be yeah, a, yeah. an additional thing that we did because we wanted to break out and it had already been three months of just talking about Mertzbaugh records every week, yeah. which was really cool, but it, it was just time for time for something else time to list listen to something else time to get excited about something else have you reconciled it all with masami because it seems like he doesn't talk that much at all about anything to anyone <laughs> and the fact that he kind of came at you guys about you know doing something that was really a, a tribute to his work is must have been a little bit frustrating or maybe even kind of demoralizing or maybe that's the wrong word but kind of like <laughs> I think about this a lot. 
Uh, well, not a lot. I have thought about this a lot in the past. I don't think about it much now. But first off, the stuff with him was reconciled privately, like within a couple of days. It was not a big thing. Uh, I think even if you go look at his Twitter or whatever, at the time, a couple of days later, there was a like, the problem with Murzcast has been resolved or whatever. He like tweeted about this thing. But for a couple of days, it was a, a kind of big, stupid, miserable thing. And then it got smoothed over, whatever. But so, yes, reconcil reconciliation has happened. There's no bad blood, at least as far as I know. None from us. And I've, on his end, it's we've been told that it, everything's fine. How did it feel to have him kind of come at you guys like that when you're obviously huge fans and you're doing this thing to, to pay tribute to his work and kind of have him be like, you know. I, I think it was all just a, a misunderstanding. I think it was. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't. And when I said I thought about this a lot, I wouldn't want someone doing a podcast about me. <laughs> like, right. right? Like, like every week you're talking yeah. about me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that. And it wasn't just talking about the noise. We kind of branched into talking about him personally with people who knew him. And I feel like that was maybe a, a line we didn't need to cross with the podcast of like going into people's personal historical details. While it seemed exciting at the time to get this information about this, this legend, right? Uh, there yeah. is a person on the other end of it and they're still right. out there making noise and part of this community. And so uh, it's, that's, that's kind of how I, I have thought about it in retrospect is if you were talking about me and things I did 20 years ago, maybe I wouldn't be that happy to hear it on a podcast. Um, not saying any of that is his reasoning or whatever. That's just like my personal, that's, that is how I yeah. know that I, feel about it and so yeah i get it uh yeah i i, I didn't at the time it 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 felt like a pretty big blow because it was a thing we were working really hard on but then it got reconciled yeah. and we had this other thing to shift to so there was really only i think there's not even a month break between the podcasts maybe exactly a month or something right. um where we just kind of like reset and refocused and figured out the new direction and from then on it's all been fine and yeah there's no there's like no problem as far as i yeah. am concerned or no yeah but yeah i mean if it, again it yeah it did it suck at the time yeah was it the best thing that could have happened for the podcast for what the podcast is now no. absolutely like yeah it, i i i wouldn't change <laughs> I can't say I wouldn't change a thing, but I, I wouldn't change the outcome. I wouldn't change the, the fact that we are now doing something that I feel like is much more culturally important and informative. Yeah, so for sure. That's a and, big part and, of it. And I think like, like you said, it is, like, it is also like, it is also like a reminder with – I've had kind of moments doing the podcast where I kind of remember, you know what? I should be much more conscious of just not talking about other people in sort of a, you know, I don't know, not even a critical way, but I mean like, yeah, just be, it, it, podcasts, you know, the, the, the ones that are on pop culture stuff, they're gossiping about, oh, this and that and this and that. And that's why people click them and they you know, it's like, well, right. at the end of the day, when we're in all in this kind of together and these are all people I know and respect, and it's like, I want to be much more kind of conscious about you know, blabbering about other people's business. Yeah. We're in a community and yeah. even if it seems like someone with the magnitude of a uh, Mertz Bauer or, or anything, right. Is outside right. of it because they're so known and popular. They're not, they're still part of this community and they're still part of that. So just, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I've made a conscious decision to not, do that sort of stuff going forward in terms of you have to, right? I mean, you, you said yourself, you've made that kind of realization where you're like, yeah, there's no, I want to talk about ideas and concepts and I want to talk about art and inspiration and, yeah. and process. And I don't want to talk about people as much now connections and people, you know, personal details of people. Sure. No, but yeah. connections and how you got in touch with this person and who you were yeah. networking with in the, in the eighties or whatever, those kind of things, those are fascinating to me is like, how yeah. did you come to 
start writing letters with this person or how did you end up going to Japan for the first time and who were your yeah. contacts there? That stuff is great, but yeah. like private details of people's personal lives yeah. that is in the past, I, I no interest in talking about. Yeah. It's a, it's a fine line for sure. Cause you want to, s- it is, it is. There's, we're know, trying fo- to also folklore document and, and, and folklore and stories about, about important people and important stuff. I mean, some of it's great fun. Some of it's really interesting. Some of it's funny and some people are fine with it being shared, but yeah, you got, you just gotta be, kind of tasteful and with noise extra um one question that a, a, a patreon supporter asked and that i'm also very interested in is um what does the and you, you kind of alluded to this is, but what does the research process look like for the for the interviews and and also for the reviews or for, for for the for the release focused episodes what is your research process like tara is really good at looking up like all sorts of weird facts that we would never find about like a track title, a place, a thing. She it's, she is like on that. In fact, in the, even in the MERS cast days, we joke, she was the research assistant right before she yeah. became like a full member of the, the podcast. She was like giving us information of like, this is this, this relates to this. So that there's always a wealth of information that Tara can pull out of her vast knowledge of things. She is, immensely deep with all of that kind of stuff for me and and probably for mike it's a lot of looking up old interviews trying to figure out where there's old interviews to yeah. i don't want to re-ask the same questions but also if there's something interesting this is a new format and an audio format so it right. is good to cover that stuff right not everybody read the interview in a magazine from 15 years ago so right. getting it this information out there is still important uh, looking up old reviews of things, looking up old archival information about things, trying to, I mean, some stuff we get, we have the benefit of getting to like, we've already talked to the artists. We can ask them about these things. That's really fun. And, and you can get a whole different perspective that way. Like we, uh, we just did like a seven inch episode on death pile on the Patreon and we got a bunch of info from Jonathan Kennedy about yeah. it. So yeah, that's that stuff is also really cool, but it's a lot of our knowledge and checking the usual sources and trying to figure things out, uh, looking at old catalogs, looking at old reviews, looking at any of this stuff. Like when we talked to Al Margolis, one of the things I did is went through Franz DeWard's vital book and looked up like reviews of some of the old Ifbuana stuff. Just cool. it's a, having also a knowledge of where a lot of this stuff is from, yeah. um, or where you might be able to find it. So that's like, having a huge thing of noise books. And if we're talking to someone from this era, I know I've got to go look through these books, see if there's an index, check it and see if there's any mentions of them. Uh, if there's stuff from around the time of a seminal release, trying to find information on it there. So it can, sometimes it can be very quick where we are just going through kind of talking about an album. There's not a lot of info about it. Some yeah. of this stuff, fatal impact, find me some info on fatal impact, please. Pretty please. <laughs> like, I've looked up the house that the address was at on Google Maps to see, but you know what I mean? Like stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But I find me some info on that project and, and give it to me. Like, I, yeah. I would love it. So sometimes there's not that much and we just get to focus on the sounds. Yeah. And sometimes there's a, a wealth of information. People are very verbose and they go over a lot of stuff and they do interviews. So, yeah. or it's just personal knowledge. Like I, certainly like try to get my timeline correct on stuff like this uh, interview we just did with Drew McDowell. I tried to get my general timeline of when he was involved in things, but also I'm asking questions. So I'm going to get new information. Yeah. And I also have a lot of my own thoughts about it. So did I have to do a ton of research leading up to that one? No. Do I think that we still asked a lot of cool questions and got cool answers? Like, yeah, because there's already a, a personal knowledge of that stuff I could talk about coil and i've been following all of drew's soul work since he put out collapse so yeah. it's it's like an easy thing to to cover and to focus on so it really just depends right sometimes sure. we'll solicit friends if they know something about a thing we'll get information or get put in touch with someone who knows more about it there's episodes we have planned where i am uh like waiting for an expert and i've even asked people that i know are into certain things of like i really want to cover this do you do you or someone you know like have expertise on this right there's yeah. some things like you want to talk about pierre henry i want to like talk to someone who is really focused in that world and and get like more info about it from someone who can guide us and give us some stuff and some of the episodes we have guests on they pick records that they are very 
intrinsically linked to or very yeah. it's very personal to them or they right. you know like like doing the zev stuff with blake edwards like he friends with you know knows yeah. a ton about can can go on at length and was a very important record to him so that sort of thing is also really nice and helpful it just it just depends um yeah, there's a lot of there's there's some wayback machining. I mean, there's all these kind of like yeah. goofy little things you got to do that you're just sitting in front of a computer or sitting in front of a stack of old magazines or catalogs, trying to figure out. And it, it varies per episode. It's always a yeah. different process. But it's cool that you guys are not only one person with deep fascination, history, knowledge of this stuff, but three people. So I mean, it's like you guys have the ability to maybe all kind of work together cover you know blind you know one maybe one person has a blind spot in some certain area right. the other person can kind of pick that up and absolutely we share a lot of the like i uh, the three of us is our strength right we we can all kind of lean on each other for different things and that comes down to like all aspects of the podcast like even doing the editing and stuff is like i go through and make marks and notes while we're recording a podcast for edits or things to pick out or whatever. And then it can even be simple things like mic bumps or someone coughing. Yeah. Right. And then Connelly will listen through again and send more notes of anything that I might've missed. And I'll listen through again and make all those edits. And we just do, we have like a system in place where yeah. we all back each other up on these things. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a really nice working relationship. I mean, I've been friends with those guys for 20 years, so it's really, yeah. I, I get to work, I get to talk to them every day now as like part of our, our work, right? Part of the thing we do. And it's it's really rewarding and it's really, uh, yeah. We, we send a lot of links back and forth. One of us will find an interview that maybe we missed or whatever when we're prepping for something. So there'll be a text with some links to some old interviews or like a Wayback Machine thing or even, oh, this is what, this is the flower that's referenced in this track and the yeah. year it's referencing is because of this battle or this kind of like historical thing that have like you get stuff like that all the time. So learning about that stuff is part of what keeps it interesting too, is because, you know, I For talk you a lot about noise and I'm fascinated yeah. with noise. And I said, I don't know what I do without noise, but uh, artists are so interesting in what, where they pull inspiration from the things that click with us in our heads, the things we choose to reference that seeing that individuality in everyone and finding out a little bit of reasoning behind it is yeah. really, really fun and keeps it fresh like every week. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. You've also done some kind of things utilizing other sorts. I mean, I think one thing that's very, you know, kind of unique about you and I don't know if Connolly was on board the first podcast, but it seems like you've been kind of on the the cusp or the cutting edge or the beginning of these kind of phenomenons. I mean, a podcast and, um, you know, you've also done stuff now on like Twitch streams, uh, I think building, uh, contact mics and building gear and stuff like that. And like kind of other, it seems like you're kind of into using these kind of open platforms that are sort of social media related, but, but, you know, kind of these modern platforms for sharing content, what you do, which not a lot of people do. Um, why do you think that's important? And why do you think the majority of kind of the scene is somewhat resistant to those kind of, or at least, at least doing it themselves, those kind of projects or, or platforms? Hmm. Well, Roman was doing his podcast before we started or certainly. And so that, that is one, one yep. of the people who was like at the forefront of doing this stuff You're right. well before we started. And, uh, and his work is much appreciated. Like, that's yep. that's great, and uh, I'm I'm sad. Harsh truth has stopped, but I understand it's it, this is a big time commitment to do it full bore, and it's hard to do in piecemeal. It's it's like right. that's why we decided on weekly when we, we yeah. were doing this podcast. Uh, I love Twitch streams. I am a fairly avid Twitch watcher. as like background entertainment. Um, yeah. Uh, lifelong interest in weird video games and also some of the like weird stuff that people uh, make or or do on there that's outside of what the platform has geared itself for doing really yeah. and so you can find some some cool stuff on there and it's a 
even before Amazon bought it, which is uh, an unfortunate reality of Twitch yeah. now, it, it was just a great place that had the, the tech to stream. And again, there's there's caffeine, there's kick, there's uh, Facebook live, there's YouTube live. Yeah. There's all these other things that have come to kind of try to supplant it. But it, it much like Blue Sky or whatever the thing that replaced was there going to replace Facebook was or whatever a while ago, all those things there's they haven't they haven't right. twitch is still there right. it still has the biggest user base that still has yeah. the most eyes on things and podcasts the same kind of thing like i think it's just an easy way 20 plus years ago i was writing reviews you know it's the same kind of thing and i was doing it in a web medium whereas when i was a teenager whatever i was writing about was in a zine format right it's just right. embracing the technology we have and i'm resistant to that in some ways like i think a lot of people are especially noise people who a lot of us are you still see a divide in terms of laptop noise right analog or pedal noise uh modular noise and experimental stuff yeah and there's also a divide from some people in terms of you know we've got four track and vhs things as like they're heavily fetishized in this scene we tend to yeah. look towards the old things. But I think what's funny about that is that a lot of the artists that we revere, a lot of the artists that we talk about, a lot of the artists that were really pushing boundaries and doing new things when they were getting sense, those were new things that were exactly. exciting ways to change the landscape of music. When they were getting four tracks, that was what was available. And a lot of yeah. those people moved on embracing newer technologies in terms of all of these things, recording tech equipment, whatever is what the, the artists, before us were doing some of them were sure certainly using the oldest things they can find and whatever cheap hand-me-down stuff but a lot of people once they got the ability were pushing forward with new technology and we fetishize those things in the past because it's what our forefathers used yeah but it's it's foolish to kind of ignore the potential of this stuff especially when you see something like twitch that even when i came to it already had a pretty solid like a bit, you know, user base and, and whatever, and it already been established. It's still an area that we don't see a lot of noise stuff in. And I'd mentioned getting invited to this discord recently uh, via a Twitch message actually, yeah. because they do uh, the Monday Twitch noise, Twitch stream. Yeah. And I think that that is a, that's a great way to use it to try and share this stuff and to build a community and show this stuff. So you get to interact with people, especially in this live streaming stuff where we do the podcast. It's a recorded thing. People can listen to us. But when I'm sitting here with my camera over me making contact mics or soldering up some pedals or something, it's I've got some distraction from what I'm doing so I can talk to people. People yeah. can ask questions and hang out and we'll talk about noise. I've done some like Twitch stream DJ stuff where I'm just playing ambient noise records on here yeah. and people come and hang out. And it's just a nice opportunity to get to interact with people but i think if we ignore the new formats then we're only doing ourselves a disservice at this point and i say that with a bunch of garbage vintage gear and whatever behind me but you know i've also got like nice handheld zoom recorder and audio interface yeah. and any of this stuff that like i think that that stuff gets overlooked because it's not fetishized right yet but you even see people like utilizing like early digital cameras, like old, like Canon cyber shots or whatever. Now it has yeah. like its own look and aesthetic to it. So there's always this going backwards to maybe it's cheap until it gets popular. Maybe it's disused. Maybe it's just what you already had. Cause you've had it for 10, 15, 20 years, right. but the new platforms and new opportunities to share stuff, especially like this is really important. I think so too. And I think, um, you know, I, th I think like you talk about this, this community and this interaction is a huge part of why we all love this. And I think every human needs that, of course. And I think the fact that everyone's so addicted to Instagram and stuff like that is a big testament to that, where we've kind of melded this, you know, quote unquote underground community or this, this, this really raw vital art that it doesn't really have a commercial or mass appeal We've kind of melded that then with the same platforms that, you know, are designed for just general addiction and social, you know, clicking and scrolling. That's kind of where that all f occurs. But there are seem 
just kind of go back to, go back to the forum thing. There are all these other types of models and platforms that make the connection and the community and the interaction, the networking more possible and more, I think, precise, more dynamic, more informative, but aren't necessarily as fucked up and acerbic as, you know, like, like Instagram, for example. I don't know. I've never used Twitch before, for, but for example, it seems really, it seems like a, a perfect idea to me. And like I was talking, I interviewed Andrew Grant recently uh, from the Vomit Arsonist and I was, somehow we came to the point, I was like, you should do a and a you know, like why, like, you know, you can do on whatever, even if you use Instagram Live or, or YouTube Live or whatever, you could do an artist Q&A. That ev- artists from every single other genre in the world does it. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, like, hey, I'm going to be on here. Um, hop on and let's just chat. Whatever. It doesn't have to be a Q&A. Just like, hey, let's, let's, let's chat. I mean, instead of, but it's not like people don't want it because they're on Instagram all the time DMing each other and, and scrolling each other kind of anonymous, anonymously. Yeah. Um, but I would love to see more uh, confident embracing of other types of cool media platforms that enable, I mean, I think the, 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 the face-to-face chatting or, or talking on the phone is just like, cool. Like, why don't you, why don't, why don't we want to do that more? You know? Yeah. I mean, we were really resistant even to using zoom at first cause we wanted to be in person with people doing the podcast. Right. And That'd then, be the best. That, that option was taken away from us. And I'll say, you know, you've done in, uh, interviews in person. Like the, these remote interviews are, easier to from a production standpoint to manage and edit and yeah. put out than an in-person thing where the the room might not sound good there might be some flubs there's more stuff to edit you yeah. can't maybe get isolated audio tracks and that kind of stuff so it's it's funny how much things have changed in terms of even my thoughts on it but you see even some of the old guard embracing a lot of this new stuff like uh like mortis Mortis does like a monthly meeting with his Bandcamp subscribers yeah. over like a li- like a live stream thing where you can hang out and chat. And that guy's been around making music since the nineties, <laughs> and he's right. he's embracing this like live chat with fans thing still because why why would you not do that? You can't you yeah. can do that now. It's an option. You didn't have that option 30, 40 years ago, right? There wasn't exactly. a thing you could do. Yeah. So I, I like seeing people embrace this stuff when there've been times when it, at shows noise extra will like try to stream a chunk of the show, which like watching a noise show on your phone is like not ideal, but you can get some of it and you can see people chatting and there's some interaction there and you get an idea of what it sounds like. And maybe the performance looks good. And yeah, I don't think I'm documenting the, the, the giving the finest document of someone's live performance, but maybe they're playing in your town in a month and then you can go yeah. see them. So exactly. it's that sort of thing too, of like, it's some, some way to connect and maybe not advertise is the wrong word, but expose people yeah, to exactly. different things as well. They, and stuff comes out of live that wouldn't come out of a, a recorded format too. Right. Yeah. I think all that stuff is cool. I mean, it's here. I mean, <clears throat> we can complain about it maybe being bad, but it's here for sure. I think there should be more, conscious embracement bracing in the in the in the noise scene of what's good from those things and to use them instead of just either rejecting them wholesale or just using whatever's the easiest which is happens to be instagram you know i don't know right right you also know or at least you feel like you know what your audience is on some of those platforms because you have a number beside it that tells you followers and same thing with you know building a a follower base or whatever on any platform is difficult. Like starting right. a new forum now would be difficult. It's going to take time to get people there right. to talk about it. So you need a dedicated core of people to kind of be there and yeah. you need some consistency in terms of yeah. doing that stuff in order to actually grow it in the same way that you can. Some of the other stuff that's already existing and very entrenched. Right. Yeah. So I guess people yeah. maybe, yeah, I guess those number counts and maybe the, you know, the like counts that are, you know, Maybe that makes people feel, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to try something and flop and just look, look stupid. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. It doesn't feel good to go live on Twitch and have like four people watching you. It's, right. it, you know, it's not, it's, it doesn't feel necessarily very rewarding, but when you do that, you, 
maybe those people will come back next time. Or maybe some of the stuff I've done on there is like I've I did like a two hour recording session where I set up my gear and put a camera over it, put the, yeah. the colored lights on. It was dark out yeah. and recorded the stuff and just did it on camera. Yeah, and it's cool. That is I wasn't trying to get a live streaming experience out of it necessarily. And I wasn't trying to have the most views. I was trying to just do, just record something, just have yeah. a session where I'm sitting around and experimenting and people can kind of sneak in on it and watch if they want. And yeah, that's, and that's that, great. what I got out of it was I have two hours of recordings that I get to go through and utilize for projects. Yeah. And hang out with four people is cool. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you hang out with four people at your house, that's a good time. Yeah, exactly. It's not, like, it's not like, you're like, oh, there's only four exactly. people hanging out. It's like, oh, there's cool. There's four people hanging out. We're, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, so I, I, think I think it can feel a little bit like there's only four people at the gig is is the right. concern, right? Yeah. That's a that's a different feeling. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's true. But, Although some of the yeah. best shows I've played have been to nearly empty rooms because you yeah, know you exactly. can do whatever yeah. and there's a different atmosphere. We need to understand that that's the, that's the life we've chosen yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of gigs, I'm going to jump back to actually a question that another Maniac Circle supporter had. And they wanted to know, we, we, we talked about details about people as maybe not the best, and this is someone who's passed, but I'm still hoping that you might be able to share some things. Is uh, Details about seeing Taint live in Grand Rapids. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's about a three-hour drive from Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. I... I think I'd only, I think I'd only been out there for work once or twice before, uh, and that was about it. It was Goat, Lockwell, Numina, and Taint. There may have been one other on the bill. I'm forgetting. I actually have some photos from that around here somewhere. They they surface every now and again. I was very excited. I had been in contact with Keith and had been buying, you know, tapes off him and really i mean as today love taint and and yeah. mania and his material but that was one of the first like bigger or exciting noise shows that i was gonna go see and i was taking a trip for it right so i remember getting there and being outside of the venue or whatever and i saw a taint i remember his shirt it was said, how do you solve a problem? And then it just had a bunch of different guns and weapons on it. And then the bottom said, depends how big it is. And I was like, I was, <laughs> you know, and it's Keith. He's tall, bald, big beard, yeah. big guy. And I'm like, oh, oh, hey, I'm the guy that's been writing you. You know, I do yeah. this web zine, whatever. Yeah. We met quickly and then he was on his way to get food or something. So we, we went inside to check out the venue. And it was like a cafe with the tables and chairs pushed kind of out of the way. Yeah. And uh, it was a very unceremonious show in the daytime in an empty like storefront on a corner or like strip mall kind of thing. It was not at a venue. There was a PA on some sticks and yeah. it was a small, weird place. I was, of course, awkward. I brought my friend Jim, who had like a, a nice camera. He probably has better photos than me now that I think of it. Um, but I knew him from like the goth club in the 90s and he was... I've talked about this before. He was the guy that also turned me on to like cold meat industry and bought me my first Tesco records. Cool. Um, so shout out to Jim. <laughs> yeah. The guy I haven't been in touch with in years, but he, he uh, really liked the dark ambient and this was not quite his gig, obviously a, a noise gig, but he also knew taint. I think he had that taint condom smelling quim box. Yeah. So the show is, uh, yeah, it's awkward. Like, it doesn't feel like a crazy heavy gig. It's not dark. There's yeah. glass walls like you can see from outside. Was it daylight? See from outside. And uh and it's again an early like a pretty early noise gig for me. There I wasn't going to a lot of these gigs and I drove for a long time and Taint started playing playing a sample. I remember the Love Tone Ring Stinger was on the table. I bought one a couple years yeah. later because of that probably. <laughs> Almost certainly. Um and he starts playing, he's playing a sample and it seems like before he started playing, there were some gear difficulties or something. And so he's playing this sample and then there's some noise for a couple minutes, 
no vocals as I remember, and then he just stopped. I think the performance was like five, maybe six minutes. And that's a lot shorter than the amount of time I drove and had to drive home. <laughs> and so at the time I was like, I, I was bummed. I was a little disappointed. I really yeah. wanted to see like, and it's taint. It yeah. was fucking terrifying to yeah. me back then. I was 22. Yeah. Like it was, it was told, I didn't know anyone <laughs> like yeah. that. I didn't, I didn't know anyone who made music with that level of like menace and focus and subject matter. Yeah. And he was a, a real legend. And I, I think there's a CDR that he released on Biteworks of that tour or stuff from around then. And, yeah. and a lot of the gigs are really short. I don't know what I was expecting. I don't know how different it could have been or what yeah. other taint shows were like, but I just remember being, I wanting so much more. I just wanted I wanted to hear Laura Smithers or, you know what I mean? I wanted yeah. to hear like some like classic taint cuts or some, something. Yeah. I, I don't know what I expected. He didn't even do vocals. I, I do not remember him doing vocals at all. And none of the pictures do I have. Does he have a microphone in his hand or anything? It was like playing a sample, some feedback, some electronics. And, and at the time it seemed like it was because of a technical difficulty or something. I remember and maybe it was just my lack of knowledge of setting up noise gear in a on a folding table in an empty cafe or whatever yeah. that made it seem like that. But it felt like something wasn't quite working right. And he ended. Uh, not sure. Don't know uh, if it was anything other than that or anything more than that. But it was uh, it was an experience that I'm very glad I had. And it was one of those like Numina played. So I also it sort of inadvertently had met. Uh, Mike Shiflett and Aaron Hibbs and Aaron Hibbs who would be in, in sword heaven. Um, and I think it's been Sarah Burnett from 16 bitch pileup and bad news determined that, that she was also at that show. So like weird connections that I would, that would later go on to forge yeah. further as friends with some of these people. Um, I also, that gig goat played and goat. Anyone who's ever seen Andy play, Goat was one of the absolute best live harsh noise acts with unmatched energy and the king of the table flip. Yeah. No one's done it better. Sorry. You'll never do it better than Andy. He he was two minutes. Here's a, here's a set. Two minutes of Goat and he flips the table, but you, I didn't need any more, right? Yeah. Like I didn't have some expectation. And, and so maybe the thing was my own expectations, but... I got to meet and talk to Keith. I have some photos from the show. Like the, all of that was really cool. Just the actual yeah. performance was was really short, and I really wanted just to be overwhelmed. And it was yeah. also a part of the setting, right? I'm talking about you know the, we've all this is 2000. You've been to a daytime noise gig in 2000 in a small town in Michigan. Like I would have liked to have seen Taint, you know like whatever <laughs> on a stage with 200 people going nuts and like throwing shit around. Like that's, that's what I would want to see. I think I heard stories about that tour that that was very common. And for some reason that kind of does fit with his attitude in some way. <laughs> yeah. You know, like he yeah, wasn't really want to want to be like, Oh, do you guys want more? Like, Oh, let me, you know, he, <laughs> yeah. let me put on a good no, show for you guys. And knowing him better. And in retrospect, like it, 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 made sense and it's not like a thing i've thought about over the years like oh, i'm really but it was at the time i remember just wanting so much more from it because i was fascinated yeah with taint but I you was, stayed fascinated right absolutely yeah it's to this day i mean yeah he's he's one of the greatest uh, fantastic discography still happy that there's some reissues happening i hope there's more proper issues of the stuff that get out there for both mania and taint. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was one of those guys who like impacted a lot of people who was trading with a lot of people who was in contact with a lot of people and who definitely left his mark and the like variety of secret unknown uncredited mystery projects and stuff that are left around from that man that like maybe we'll never know if he was involved in this or that you hear some tape and it's just good and it's like from a certain era it, it could be it could have been keith you mentioned elysian alarms your album being 
you know, this is the album that came out. I'm the name I or the the year I don't have that off the top of my head, but a couple years ago, one or two years. Yeah, ago, right? that's twenty. I think we had tests in the initial pressing of the record in 2019, and then the actual records in 2020 because of uh, problems with the pressing plant that we had to right. find a new place. But I'm, I might be wrong on dates. The last couple of years yeah. have thrown a sense of time off for everybody. I think. Oh, for sure. Um, but you know, it, it is quite a different album from a lot of previous hive mind material. And you've mentioned that as well. So can you talk about that album and how, how what's different about that album, what that album means to you? Yeah, it's, I've said before that I don't feel like I really may ever made a hive mind album. A lot of what I was doing was two track recording, uh, live jam feel you know live improvisational sessions right and sometimes i would have intent and set out but something like anarch peak with roger stella or which was still live but very intentional or uh, beneath triangle and crescent which was probably the closest thing i would say to an album where i was composing these pieces even the the vineyard stuff those were more composed than being improvisational i was taking a lot of the stuff i'd learned from improv yeah. and trying to turn it into repeatable ideas and motifs and craft songs out of it. So Elysian Alarms was the first time I went into something with the mentality that I wanted to make a record. It's not the first time that I wanted to make a record in terms of whatever you think of a record as something with a start, a middle and an end of flow ideas to it. And so I had, conceptualized this thing in the late 2000s that I was going to make as my record. It was going to be a double LP. It was this excessive idea that I had, which I actually a while ago found all of my notes for that, for everything that I was working on then. Cause I was doing a lot of kind of newer stuff and trying to push myself outside of what, what I'd done. And one of the reasons I had kind of stopped and slowed down on high mind is I'd gotten tired of doing things the way I was doing them. Elysian Alarms was a chance for me to break out of that and to reevaluate how I make that music, how I approach my studio. And what I was playing in this like industrial band called Pure Ground for a while. And I learned a lot of, I learned a lot of stuff about MIDI. I learned more about synthesis. I learned a lot more about programming and also yeah. first couple of records were recorded on a four track. I was normally just a two track guy. So I learned about, for tracking and then we got an interface so everything else was recorded like eight track into the computer digital for the last record and learning and discovering that stuff lent me to see how I could utilize it for doing hive mind but I had to break myself of the other things I learned while playing music which mm. was four four structure melody not that I don't use or didn't want to use melody and having a better understanding of how to compose melodies and such and actually tuning my sense, stuff like that, <laughs> I think benefited me. Yeah. But there were a lot of kind of things I learned that were really good and a lot of habits I picked up that were not suited to what I wanted to do with hive mind. So there was a process of breaking myself apart in terms of having a long history of making improvisational experimental music and then having a handful of years writing songs and then going yeah. to doing a new hive mind record. I had a, a lot of ideas. I had a lot of things I'd worked out on live shows. I was still touring. I was still playing. I was still making little tape releases stuff, you know, yeah. smaller things that I could, that I could kind of get new ideas out with. And it took a long time. I recorded a bunch of stuff that got scrapped. I recorded a bunch of stuff that I was unhappy with. I recorded a lot of things that just didn't quite sit. And then Kyle from Difficult Interactions uh, took me out to uh, like the salt marshes near uh, near Ventura. We had like a rental property thing and I set up all my gear in there and I just focused on recording for a couple of days and also just sort of relaxing and being outside of my element. And a lot of what was on the record came out of that, which was refined versions of ideas I'd had 
or things I tried to record before, I felt like I finally hit in this environment without really any distraction but relaxing or, you know, it was, it's a strange thing because a lot of the stuff I've made before has been in like more dire circumstances, like making the, the vineyard stuff was coming right out of, this is the first stuff I made when I got a room after couch surfing for months and being living in storage. Yeah. The, they made me the keeper of the vineyards was like the first tape I recorded in the room that I was renting. So some of that stuff w yeah. carried with me. And so I had a lot of these ideas and techniques that I wanted to try. And so I recorded a bunch of stuff and it would be like three or four tracks going at the same time with all my gear spread out on a table instead of here. You can, I've, there's a keyboard stand with several keyboards on it. There's like rack gear here. It's a different yeah feeling and way of making music so i was just kind of sitting like i would at a gig or in yeah. my old home studio and focusing on the sounds and making stuff and recording multiple takes and recording these things and doing a little bit of overdubbing but a lot of just capturing things and recording them separately and then mixing took i don't know how much longer because i brought everything back and i listened to it and i made some mixes and that's one of the areas i am weakest at sometimes is figuring out or putting things together after they've been recorded because I'm so used to the two track thing. I've been getting a lot better at it. At least I feel mm -hmm. and, and a lot more confident at it. But for a while there, I was really unsure. And when I was working on that record, it was such a thing that had kind of drug on for a while. The idea and offer to do it had been sitting there for some years and I, I just hadn't really made any suitable progress. So sitting down and actually mixing it and then the thing that helped really was playing it for a few people, the mixes and figuring out what hit, what didn't listening to it on my stereo a bunch. That's the record yeah. I've made that I've listened to the most. Cause I, I just obsessed over it. I would listen to it in the car. I would listen to it here and a couple little suggestions from friends definitely made a difference and having that material kind of concretized the how the album would go. And I was able to see kind of a clear path through it and the things that I wanted to say with it. So it's a very, very important record to me personally. And I hope that the amount of work I put into it <laughs> shows, but it, it felt very rewarding to have this sort of sure. finished product and difficult interactions went all out with, I mean, gatefold yeah. metallic inks, poster flexi, like, all that, all that stuff, yeah. like, really went above and beyond in terms of pressing the record, Absolutely. and it felt really nice to have. It's a very nice document. I feel like the the first edition of that thing that is very special to me. And when I look at it, I'm, I still get very happy about the whole thing. So it's a different looking record for me. Yeah, I did the design for it, and I just wanted something new. You know, there's a, a lot of high mind stuff that has yeah. a look to it, and it's. Uh, yeah, it was a, a really important step forward, and I have a lot of new stuff that I've been working on and new ideas, but I also have started probably too many new weird side projects and other things. There's other... It's always something, right? So there's I have all this material I've been recording yeah. that I don't really know what I'm doing with that is not Hive Mind and not Black Sand Desert and not any other like sort of project I have. Some stuff that I do is like for sediment and for my, my collaborative project with the Connellys and yeah. I know that what that stuff right. is, but some of this other stuff is just born out of exploration and experimenting and playing with new ideas and new techniques and, and things that I pick up. So I mentioned, I'd found some notes for the record that I wanted to make in the late two thousands and I have it in my head to do that. So there's some pieces I've recorded for it. There's some stuff I have to pull out, some really old gear for there's some stuff that like is very specific to the way I was performing, but a lot of those ideas are still cemented and it was supposed to coincide with moving to Los Angeles and leaving Michigan. And it, it, now mm. as I've been here longer than I was in Michigan, I feel like it's not a bad time to revisit those ideas of like w sort of why yeah. I left. Yeah. So maybe there's a, a, new old album in me or maybe there's just something fresh and new that'll develop as i do more recording for it but it's uh i haven't figured that out yet i think it's great do you feel like with that process you had with the last album that you can go back to your old hive mind methods or do you think that's your new 
approach no, going I forward? Think, I think that uh, whatever I've adopted now is my new method, is my new way of working. Like, whatever happened with the last record has pushed forward. I'll still record the two track. It's always a great way to capture ideas, but I find that I can yeah. mix a lot easier. I can identify what things need a lot easier and I can think up the other tracks and layers in a piece while hearing one thing that I made. Uh, I've been working on my project cleanse with Jesse Sains now from Liebestod yes. and he and I have been doing a lot of recording and it'll, he's been really good for giving me prompts when we record for certain things. So especially when we started out, it was a lot of uh, me sitting down and just doing singular things. And that has also been really good to break me out of the way I normally work, where, which is very maximal. Doing this for so long, I've always felt like I mm -hmm. have to be the only one doing things and I have to be doing all of the things at the same time. And it's really not the right way to think <laughs> for me anymore. It's always good to see people and artists that I appreciate and respect that have been doing something for such a long time that's that works so well st still make breakthroughs in their methodologies and mindsets for for their work. That's exciting. It's helped keep me sane through doing this. I, I got to a point where I couldn't stand the thought of making another hive mind record the way that I've made all the other hive mind records. It really, it really got to a point where it was something that I needed to do or the project couldn't continue. And yeah. having that happen was really good because now I have so many more ideas and I've broken myself out of whatever rut I was in then, because now I have a new way to do things and that makes it more exciting and more it's freeing for me to get to not do things the same way. And yeah, yeah, I love talking about process and when people realize, you know, when they figure out they can do things a certain way, when they figure out they don't like doing things a certain way. It's one of the reasons I do this podcast still, you know, one of the reasons I do our podcast is to learn about the reasons behind that stuff. It's always inspirational to me. Absolutely. Another question from the Maniac Circle. Um, could Gray, could you ask Gray about the process of putting together the compilation at the end of the rope? An absolutely stunning double CD of various artists. Still listen to it at least once a week and still extreme. <laughs> I love that compilation. Uh, it was writing all the people who I had been in contact with or a handful of artists that I just really, really loved people I was buying stuff from and people that I knew would do the theme well. So obviously the, the compilation was split into two discs and one was about autoerotic asphyxiation and the other was supposed to be sexual strangulation. And so people picked sides basically for, you know, which, which topic they wanted to tackle. Uh, I was inspired by a few classic comps. I was definitely, I think field tales, on hospital to come out by then that was like a, just a maybe maybe it wasn't out then but around then a fantastic compilation and my comp took a long you know several years after i got the tracks to come out it was the first cd i'd pressed i didn't know what i was doing i just knew that i wanted to make a thing uh getting the artwork done all of that stuff there's now two editions of it mostly because the original artwork got damaged in that basement that i was so lovingly talked about talking about earlier flooded yeah. and uh damaged all the screen printed artwork for that release and the hive mind loss of on night maintenance cd um which i think it come out around the same time I, they must have used the same screen printer uh so yeah it was a lot of just writing people describing the theme of the compilation and asking them if they'd want to be on it and once i had a, a handful of artists you can you know you can always cite oh well now yeah yeah mania is going to be on it and prurient and whatever you have these like things yeah. that you can draw yeah. in the rest of your artists with i guess uh it didn't feel like that at the time i was just really excited to share like oh yeah so and so is going to do this and so and so and yeah so it, it came together pretty quickly i got most of the tracks in a very timely fashion from people and then it just took 
forever for me to figure out the logistics of pressing it, which that CD was pressed uh, due to Eric Hoffman at Ground Fault and helping me get that going when he was doing the CD pressing stuff. So that was like one of my first first professional uh, engagement with, with Eric. And he was wonderful back then. I did not really know what I was doing pressing a CD. But I, that CD was, yeah, it was just out of having an idea and seeing seeing the concept and then seeing who would fit and there are some really really great tracks on it i can i can still listen to it and i still have people tell me that they love that comp uh it's yeah it's a cool one i'm very happy i still have copies of it which is crazy i think i pressed a thousand cds so there's still copies of it uh i don't maybe they're not on the web store wow. if, they, if they run out of stock just email me because uh don't i see people selling them on discogs for i don't sell them for that much <laughs> they're, they're, they're still you can still get them okay. uh, from the label if if people are interested <laughs> yeah good to know good to know great so, yeah I don't, right. I don't have much um, of a story about it my biggest memory of assembling at the end of the rope was i remember when i told jonathan kennedy about the theme he said i'm gonna do it on this don't let anyone else make a track about this <laughs> so <laughs> i was that's uh, one of the reasons I, <laughs> I love John is he uh, he's he will pick a theme. He will he's got his material. He knows what it's going to be, and he just he he went right for it. And I I remember that so fondly. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Great, great. Well, I, there's more stuff I could ask you about, um, but I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I'm here. This was my plan for the day. <laughs> so, no, I, either way, I have, really. I, mean, I have like, one question. Sure. I've, I'm going to ask you in a moment uh, your top five noises. This is of all time, like I ask everyone. But before we all get right. to that, I'm I'm curious about a topic, a, a question, because you know you were so central to what I think of as the mid 2000s noise boom. There was a really strong period of activity and artistry which you were a part of and then i would say sort of started to taper off i don't know 2010 ish 2012 and just the general international interest and activity around noise at least you know pure noise harsh noise power electronics kind of went into a lull for a while I, I sometimes refer to it as the Tronics era, just for, you know, just for fun. <laughs> what do you think was the cause of that particular lull, if anything, that you can pinpoint? It seems like it's cyclical in a way with big labels getting involved in noise. So I think you probably saw it in the mid 90s with Relapse doing stuff and s while they're doing Mertzbau and the haters Masana the they were also stocking noise stuff in their distro they had Mother Savage tapes you could get Condom tapes from the Relapse catalog so mm -hmm. I think it, it hit there because there was a major label throwing money behind it so a lot of new people got exposed to it same thing happens in the early 2000s with Sub Pop right they're throwing some money at some noise People are getting excited about noise. People are learning about this thing they didn't know they needed in their life, and they get really interested. And maybe generally younger people with some disposable income and a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, and again, in the, I think it, I think it did kick off in a different way in the early 2010s with like Sacred Bones getting involved in putting out some of that stuff and making that stuff available, and then kind of the that rise of noisy techno for lack of a better term also hit around then. Yeah. So it was people getting into it through there. And I was working in a record store at the time. So I saw a lot of that stuff come through and how it kind of went. So I, I I've seen these so, sort of like roller coaster cycle of this stuff. And I think it is just people getting into it and getting out of it. I mean, it just, it just happens. And also a, a more public spotlight on it and the thing that happened in the early two th early 2010s was that there was 
advertising and PR money behind it. So I think mm. that turned some people off. And I think that that also got a lot of new people to learn about something that was, that was there. You'd see pitchfork reviewing noise records, uh, in much larger f- or more common frequency than you, you would have before you would see, uh, ads for things or, you know, just a different level of hype reviews for everything everywhere because promo copies were getting sent out and press releases were getting yeah. sent out. Uh, and there were distributors carrying the stuff. So in the mid 2000s, it was there was Volcanic Tongue, there was Second Layer, there was uh, Freaks in Future, an audio bot in Belgium doing some distro. There was we had the Hospital Store in the you know mid late 2000s. Yep. Yep. There were shops carrying this stuff. There were smaller distributors or places overseas that were buying stuff. And so it got into a lot of hands and ears, but running a postage costs have gone up insanely and running a distro is, uh, as you know, like really, really hard, impossible. It's like to, yeah, for a label to sell you something at a price that you can then make a profit off of and that, but people can't get somewhere cheaper, especially if it has to go overseas is it's really difficult. It's really hard. And I, I, I know that from working in the record store and also from running the record label of just how hard it is to get stuff this time and how hard it can be to compete when, Oh, there's a it's $4 cheaper over here. You know, whatever people, people don't care about right. anything, but their own pocketbooks a lot of the time when it comes to that, which is totally fair to them. But it sometimes means you're stuck with something you can't get rid of or whatever. And then it changes how you buy things in the future. There was a time when that stuff was all really, really popular and really selling. And, I mean, you call it the Tronics era. Look at look at Packrec. Phil was churning out CDs and doing them on yeah. the cheap so you could get them cheap and they cost nothing to mail. So that yeah. was a big part of the proliferation yeah. of that. We owe a lot to Phil for that of like pressing yeah. a thousand Rita CDs in a wallet, in a little yeah. card wallet thing that you can ship cheaply. Excuse me. You can ship cheaply and easily uh, without having to really worry about much right and with and postage was obviously a lot cheaper back then but also just getting yeah. that stuff out there was made easy having the kind of pure yeah. triple r mentality of like three for 20 also helped so tronics did yeah. a lot for that phil did a lot for getting noise Absolutely. out there and helping to popularize it and having the board at that time was was a really big part of it the lull is i think also due to that decentralized nature of things where we don't have a place to go for all of this stuff, for all the new releases, for all of that stuff. And the ones that have tried haven't succeeded in, in capturing that same thing and having the place to do that. So where, where do you find out about it? There's tons of killer stuff that I would love to cool tape labels and releases and things I would love to check out, but I, I don't know where to find them. I don't hear about them until it's too late. Like that's true for everybody. I think of, Oh, I missed this tape that I didn't even know was out. Right. So it's a lot harder to find the stuff now and you have to be a little bit more of a diehard. So the casuals have probably fallen off buying stuff because they don't know where to go to look for it. They don't know how to find out about the new things and they're not going to be on four different forums to make sure they don't miss a, a tape announcement. Yeah. Yeah, but it'll come back. Maybe also, it'll happen again. <laughs> yeah, I think oh, I think it is pretty strong now. But I think the I think the lack of there are distros out there, but I don't think there are as many big distros that people can trust. I think at least in the United States, I've heard people complain about that that there aren't really that many distros in the United States that are like self abuse was or like you mentioned the other ones that are like they get it all, they ship it all, even if you're not following the the boards and the posts and everything that if you're keeping an eye on this, these distros, you know, that stuff is going to come through there and you can just pick, pick stuff up. And I mean, I, I think that works pretty well over here. I feel like that that's pretty effective, but I think, I think that's sort of something that people should remember is very important. The distros and large and small yeah, are important. Yeah. If for, they, they give us a place to, you know, it's one-stop shopping, which sounds funny in the noise realm, but it is this sort of necessary evil and, and not even an evil. I mean, I, I love the distros and, and thankful to any of them that carry my stuff and they carry all the stuff that I want to get because it's so hard to keep track of a lot of this stuff that we really 
need places to put it together. But then it's also finding out about uh, limited to 40 tape or something. Like, how are you, how's a dist, how are five distros going to get copies of that? They're not, it's just not possible. So that's the other thing that, that makes it a little tricky is I feel like all of us are operating in smaller numbers than ever before because there's more of us making noise. There's more of us running labels. There's more of us sending stuff out there, but there's, that means there's less resources and money to go around both from distros, from individuals, from whatever in order to do that stuff. So we don't, there's no easy way to, to do it. It there have been attempts in the past of like maintaining a newsletter that mails out when new releases come out, that kind of stuff. I've seen people yeah. doing these kinds of things and it just, it's just so much overhead and management for it Yeah. without the reward of running a distro, which is maybe some small financial gain or getting more stuff for your collection or whatever people start distros. Yeah. There's, there's just not even that when you're doing this sort of thing, right? There's just nothing. If you're trying to, make sure everyone knows about the new releases there's no reward to it yeah <laughs> it's a thankless job yeah so it's yeah true. it's unfortunate it's that, that that's the reality of it but i think i think the fact that people are still holding strong and still releasing stuff still active pretty much not more than ever but in, i would say in a pretty high capacity um, is a testament to the fact that people are really doing this because they need it and love it, you know? Yeah, you can't you can't kill noise and you can't kill the underground. Like, people are going to continue doing this. And things have been made so much more difficult with tape manufacturing, go, you know, becoming extinct. Uh, the, yeah. the tape duplicators being expensive and really backed up and clogged up and not wanting to deal with your shit. Yeah. And just the the cost of doing any sort of cd or vinyl release is expensive it's a big investment and you have to make a conscious decision you can't just make 40 of a cd it, it's right. a waste of money it's it, you're gonna throw away 160 260 cds in order to get those 40 so it's a uh, it's tricky it's a tricky thing but people yeah. that are doing it now obviously love it and they obviously care about it and are part of a community that's why anyone's making a tape now it's certainly not to get rich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want to ask you to tell me what your top five noise releases of all time are. This is a terrifying question. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying question. Uh, let's see here. On the spot a bit. Can you but... Yeah, I think I got it. I'm just... I'm I'm looking to the side now. I'm looking at my records, just hoping a couple things yeah. really uh -huh. click. And Condom Eighth Pillar has to be one of the first things mm -hmm. mentioned. It's a massive record in terms of scope and influence. Uh, one of my most treasured treasured records, or not even record tapes, is Taint's Misogynist Lust. I think that that is possibly the most perfect taint in terms of sound and i could listen to it at all times uh, we did an episode about it for noise extra little roger for life That's something i can always mm. always hear uh what is that three i got two more to go <laughs> three. <laughs> oh man MSVR, Blazing and Sharp, Mass for Dead Insects, another one that we did an episode about, is still a massive, massive record to me. Um, yeah, that one, that one definitely gets it. And I'm not sure if it's Wound Fucker or Paranoia that I'd have to put on there for Atrax Morgue, but. Okay. One of the two of those. And that's not really, uh, that's more power electronics on all, on all ends of that, except for the MSPR and blazing and sharp. That's fine. Um, I, I consider that noise. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, that's always been the sort of angle that I went with it from. And I love lots of harsh noise, but really thematic records with a little bit, you know, 
lyrical content, whatever I think just resonates a touch more with me. So yeah, that that would probably be my top five. I you asked me tomorrow, it could change. I've I've got my candle has yeah. died staring at me on the shelf over here. Like you didn't mention Escort, you asshole. So yeah. the Chop Shop uh, <laughs> double ten inches also staring at me from one of the yeah. shelves fronted. And it's like I I don't know. There's there's too much to to think about. Like picking five is unfair. I if it weren't just noise records, you know, like Moonlay Hidden Beneath the Cloud would be in there, but it's not yeah really noise but like yeah definitely like smell of blood with victory is a top five record of all time for me so different uh, it's it's hard to narrow it down i have to make myself some parameters <laughs> that's cool i think lists i think lists are always fun but i think you know like a top 100 list would be fun too like that you know joe rummer's top 100 noise releases yeah i could put like Just, 20 of my own on there and <laughs> have a, have a day should, with you things. should yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's one of my favorite thing yeah. about Joe's list is seeing how many Joe projects. Coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But like, I think more people should do that. I think you know, I mean, you kind of that's kind of what Noise Extra is in a way. It's a kind of running thing, but I think it'd be cool if people. I, I I'm just for more, you know, kind of centralized like publishing stuff, like you know, Gray's like top 100 noise releases of all time, and then just have that on your website somewhere. You know, I don't know, just just like. More of those because those those lists are huge, and I think when I was discovering noise, one thing I love about Purient is in so many of his records, which were some of the first noise records I found. In so many of his records, particularly like the the more larger pressings on bigger labels, like you know, they have you know, oftentimes you know things like recommended reading on yeah. Love and Death, that all it says, and things like that, and. I don't know. Eighteen-year-old me was always like, "I gotta find these books and, you know, like right, check out this right, poetry, yeah. and stuff like, like, <laughs> like you know, like stuff that I wouldn't really have." But it was just you know, you you respect an artist so much, you respect a person. Their list is gonna mean a lot to you. Yeah, it's true. And so I think that's always that's always really really appreciated. That's why I ask people because I love hearing what people's top top records are. I think it says a lot about who the, who who they are too. You know. I, I just realized that I think all all of the things I mentioned we've done episodes about for Noise Extra, which is why they're, you know, I, I left off Toro Machine, but that's like an easy Mertzbau to like look to as as my yeah. favorite also, and and could you know was the thing that started the Mertz cast. So, it, like, it's so hard to give a list and then be like, oh wait, but it's I get to talk about these things all day and yeah. favorites change, but things yeah. that really stick with you for a long long time, they're they're just there like five is is not enough i'm sure uh no, other no, guests no. <laughs> feel similarly but there's yeah five five's not enough i could i could list favorites for you know probably uh four years worth of <laughs> episodes as we've done yeah. right like we don't usually yeah. pick things we we don't like so no. going yeah, exactly. going towards that exactly. stuff i won't show you mercy with this question then because i've been kind of lenient with some people lately but I want to know then five things of the last year that you love. Because I know you're listening to stuff more than – some people aren't really listening to stuff that much. But I, I feel like you're listening to stuff. Oh, God. Uh, this is always so tricky. I, I had this book that I was writing down what I was listening to in because doing recent listening for the podcast can get tricky when you just try to remember or you put stuff back. Mm-hmm. I really like the the boot gar sounds from the Kathmandu Horror House tape that Dillaway just released, which is like field recordings oh. from a, a haunted house type attraction, like a theme park haunted house type attraction in Kathmandu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> classic Aaron Dillaway stuff. So weird field recordings of a weird thing that sound weird. It is great. It's on his band camp. <laughs> Definitely recommend it. I really loved uh loop war the new roger stella thing that was on hospital really good tape really just special i, I always love roger's stuff and his approach to editing and, and putting sounds together which is one of the things that has made so much macronympha stuff great and so much of his solo work really strange and and really good hollow serpent tooth four live wires and Lone Wolves, I believe, is the title. Yep. Really love that tape. Uh, it made me go and get the other Hollow Serpent Tooth tapes that I didn't have. I was like, yeah, this one's good. I got to hear all the other stuff now. Um, yep. So that was really good. 
uh, when did that first Star tape come out? The the, the first uh, one. That's that's more than a year now. I don't know what I'm talking about. The first one is called Lenses for Polymuse, and it's like 2000. I got I got the CDR and I got it like late. I can't even keep track of this stuff. But that's that's. I mean, I I, I that doesn't matter. The point is newish in in terms of past several sure. years. That's that's what I mean. It's 2019, actually. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's kind of a wrong one, but that I really enjoyed. I mean, I like Elephant in the Snow okay. too. I really, yeah, I like Star stuff a lot. Uh, my timing is off, but uh, yeah, I really like Sacred Violence Noise. Mm. Really worth yep. just great yeah that was the first one that hit me i know other people have been hyping and talking about his stuff and that that one i was just like yeah okay i get it <laughs> i get it <laughs> so, yeah yeah that's a kind of really kind of only special yeah yeah i mean that's that's the thing is the things i value more now like moonbeam terror uh overwhelming and alive like just stuff that's new and feels different to me is really yeah. exciting. I don't spend a lot of my time listening to genre specific or, you know, subgenre specific noise. I, I like to the really unique and personal sounding stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, For sure. that's, that's definitely been kind of, I, I think that was five, maybe more. Cause I got some dates wrong, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's been what's yeah. Yeah. really been hitting lately, but I've been getting cool stuff. My friend, uh, Josh put out a tape on his label, Gush Organization, and it sent me a copy of it, first noise tape, and it's a fucking killer, you know? And it's one of those things like, I knew What's him, it called? J.D. Evans, who's running Gush Organization. Yeah, so the name is J.D. Evans. Yeah, I knew him outside of noise because he was, which talking about podcasts earlier, it was one thing that didn't get brought up that was, directly responsible for Merzcast, uh, was helping the guys at Podcast 99 start their podcast, which was a podcast about Woodstock 99. But they didn't know how to do a podcast, so I was the engineer and just recorded them, did the mixing, and helped them publish the episodes until they learned how to do it themselves. And I got too busy with my own podcast, which didn't exist when I started helping them with that one. So I learned a lot from that and from them. And Josh was part of that podcast early on uh, until he had moved back to Atlanta. Cool. So knowing him outside of noise and his interest in noise kind of blossoming after we were hanging out was really cool to then get a tape from him. And it's really good. <laughs> you know, it's really exciting. That's Someone awesome. sends you their yeah. first works and you're like, ah, this is way better than the first stuff I made. <laughs> like, nice. you know, yeah. Cool. Shout out to Josh then. Well, great. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. This was a lot of fun. Is there anything you'd like to add or, or let us know about that we didn't address or anything you got coming no, up? That... I just appreciate everyone listening uh, to to both Noise Extra and White Centipede. I'm, I'm thankful to you for doing your podcast. I know we have kind of different focuses and approaches to this thing, and I think that it's uh, it's a really good and healthy thing <laughs> that we have, like, yeah, just these, these kind of different it's styles of things for people, and it's, uh, yeah, it's really, it's nice. It's nice to just more awareness of noise and how important it is in all of our lives. Those of us who are still doing it for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, whatever it is. Uh, it's, I'm just happy. There's more documentation of all of it. So thanks to everyone who listens, who sends in stuff, who uh, supports yourself, me and our, and our podcast, the distros, the labels, all that stuff, like fucking noise. We're all we got. We need each other. Too true. All right, Gray. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Oscar. And we'll talk soon. All right, later. Head over to the Patreon now to hear the extended segments of this interview and heavy sponsors and noise fiends. If you're watching this premiere live, look out for a post in the next few minutes, giving away those Hive Mind Remix LPs. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. And see you next week for the White Sampy Noise video party.